And I know the angels in heaven rejoice. We rejoice tonight. And, uh, of course, the look on Pam's face is priceless. We love the Krim family. We're glad that you're here. It will be a somewhat of a condensed version of class tonight. But, but I said, this is a great reason to have a reduced time in Bible class. Uh, hey, Todd, hey, don't hang on one second. Michelle, I think Todd was going to be able to give you the Lord's Supper in the back while he's thinking about it back there right now. We'll get you taken care of. All right. I did speak with James Barnes this afternoon. James's voice is a little bit stronger, and so uh, Janice is still fairly weak, I think. So anyway, he's uh, very appreciative for anybody who's checked up on him, prayed for him, and all that kind of thing. But they are looking forward to being back at some point. He does miss everyone. And if y'all just knew how it bothered James that he was not able to finish this class. And so, you know, this is not his first rodeo. He's, he's had that experience before. And so, as I've said before, I'm not James Barnes, but I will try to see if we can finish this out today. And I will guarantee you with the time that we have allotted tonight, I will not get through everything that I had planned for, but I had really prepared too much material uh, because I knew I could always cut back if need be. And so uh, for those of you who are joining us by way of live stream, we're glad that you're tuning in also, uh, getting to witness Michelle's baptism into Christ. Uh, what a blessing that was. And we are going to close out the study of the book of Nehemiah tonight that James started at the beginning of this Bible class quarter. And with that being said, James attacked this book from the angle of leadership principles. And so leadership qualities or characteristics in a study of the book of Nehemiah, which I thought was a great way to study the book. And so... Um, we have gone over several things, and I worked our way through chapter 12 last time, last week when we were here, and not knowing if James would be able to finish out the class or not. And so my plan tonight is for us to look at chapter 13 in uh, the book of Nehemiah. But I had something I wanted to start with uh, first. When Phil gets it swapped over to the PowerPoint slides, thank you, Phil. I wanted to go back to chapter 12 because I gave you my own rendition of a leadership characteristic or quality that I found in chapter 12. And does anybody remember what it was? Ah, Lori's on top of it. A leader praises by prescription. We talked about the idea of uh, worship according to the command of David, going back to the Old Testament. <clears throat> earlier on as we looked at some of that information. The problem was, see, I didn't have access to James's notes on that one. And so I tried contacting him that day and was unable to get a hold of him. But I'm able to give it to you tonight. And here's why it's important for me to do that. This was James's class, not mine. And I knew that y'all had been keeping up with James's points on these leadership qualities. And I knew you would want the entire list. And so I gave you my own from chapter 12 last time, and I was prepared to give you my own from chapter 13, but the good news is James gave me the final two. And so I hope you all are ready to write these down. Chapter 12, instead of a leader praises by prescription, it's going to be the same idea, but James worded it differently. A leader glorifies God. And when you see them involved in the praise and worship there in chapter 12, I mean, that's the case, isn't it? A leader glorifies God. We see the importance that a leader is going to place on giving glory to the one who deserves it. As we understand, uh, he is uh, the majesty up in heaven. And so that is his leadership quality or characteristic from chapter 12. I also want to give you what he's going to finish this out in chapter 13. I'm going to give it to you even before we even go over chapter 13. So you can go ahead and write it down. A leader will continue contact. 
Now, I came up with one on this also, and we were really looking at it from different angles. Because in chapter 13, Nehemiah had gone back. Uh, as you think about, he was not in Jerusalem, according to what we see in verse 6. In the 32nd year of Artaxerxes, king of Babylon, which we know Persia is the ruling dynasty at this particular junction. But he said, I had gone to the king. After some time, however, I asked leave from the king. And what we're going to see in chapter 13 is he comes back into Jerusalem. And there are going to be some things that transpire in chapter 13 that I'll bring out for us while we're talking about this tonight. But one of the things that James wanted to focus on is the fact that even though Nehemiah had gone back to the king, he wanted to come back. He wanted to keep in contact with his people. He wanted to check up on them and see how they were doing. And uh, he's going to hear about some things as he comes back to Jerusalem, which are not going to be very good things about the situation there in God's city, Jerusalem. And as you think about what is going to transpire, I really chose to focus on the bad things that were happening that Nehemiah heard about when he came back and examined what the situation was in Jerusalem. You know, it's kind of interesting as you go to the beginning of this book when Nehemiah comes to Jerusalem for the first time when he's able to survey the damage where the walls are broken down and all the different things that he encountered. It's interesting when he comes back here to Jerusalem, there are some other things that are broken. As we see about the situation with the people here in chapter 13. And so a leader will continue contact. Uh, let me uh, let me go back here. I thought I had another slide worked in here, uh, but I, I probably skipped over it. But here's what we'll do. In chapter 13, here are some of the situations that Nehemiah finds out about, as James says, when he's continuing contact with the people. Here's one of them. Down in verse 4, it says, Now prior to this, Elishib the priest, who was appointed over the chambers of the house of our God, being related to Tobiah. Hey, does that name ring a bell with y'all? Tobiah. How many times have you heard James Barnes mention the name Tobiah? All right, here's a test for you. Give me a thumbs up if he was good or a thumbs down if he was bad. bad right we know his name well, there's a reason we know his name it's because he was one of the bad dudes in the book of nehemiah he was one of the ones who was trying to oppose nehemiah and the efforts of the rebuilding of the wall there in jerusalem and it says in verse 5 with elisha being related to tobiah had prepared a large room for him which formerly they put the grain offerings the frankincense, the utensils, and the tithes of grain, wine, and oil prescribed for the Levites, the singers, and the gatekeepers, and the contributions for the priests. Okay, this is a room which was supposed to house some holy things. It was supposed to ha house some very things to be used in the service of the temple and for the contributions of the priests. And so when Nehemiah came back to Jerusalem and he learned what Elisha had done for Tobiah by preparing a room for him in the courts of the house of God, here's what it says in verses 8 and 9. It was very displeasing to me so that I threw all of Tobiah's household goods out of the room. Then I gave an order, and they cleansed the rooms, and I returned there the utensils of the house of God with the grain offerings and the frankincense. It's interesting how this is worded. 
Because Nehemiah comes back and he is appalled at what he finds. And he comes in and he throws all of Tobiah's belongings out of there. Why did he do that? Didn't belong, right? That's not where he's supposed to be. In fact, if you go back uh, thinking about what they would have read from the book of Moses and about uh, what would happen with the, the foreigners and how they were excluding all the foreigners from Israel and that no Ammonite or Moabite should ever enter the assembly of God. That's why Tobiah had no place in that room. And so there was something there that didn't belong. And as you think about how ne nobody else was taking care of this situation, Nehemiah had to get that stuff out of there. And he had to get Tobiah out of there because he didn't belong. And so uh, you've, you think back to Jesus cleansing the temple. Well, here's kind of a similar situation where Tobiah and his goods are in this room in the courts of the house of God in the temple. Eh, Got to go. Get rid of it. And so I don't imagine this was him just going in and, oh, here's something. No. I would say this was very animated. I can see him going in and just throwing stuff out left and right. Okay? This would have been very animated as we understand his anger and his frustration at the time and as to how displeasing it was and it says that he threw them out of the room so that's what it states in uh, verse 8 so that's one thing that Nehemiah finds when he comes back to Jerusalem as we see described here he also discovers that the portions of the Levites had not been given to them well these things were supposed to be made as contributions these thing, these things were supposed to be given to the Levites so that they could do their work there in the service of the Lord in the temple. Well, these things had been withheld from them. And because these things had been withheld, they had left the service each to his own field. And so they weren't even there performing their duties in the temple because these things had been withheld from them. And so Nehemiah reprimands the officials and then says, Why has the house of God been forsaken? He knows that something has to be remedied. With this situation, it says, He gathered them together and restored them to their posts. They had left their post, and they shouldn't have. So he's got to get them back. And so he restored them to their post, and so they bring the tithe of the grain, wine, and oil into the storehouses. He's getting things back to the way that they're supposed to be because the people had neglected that. So that's one of the situations that is happening here also. There's something else that we see in chapter 13. And it's what we find down in verses 15 and following. There were some people who were doing work on the Sabbath. <clears throat> Big no-no, right? That's what God's people were not to be involved in. They were to do no work on the Sabbath. It was a holy day. It was separated for the Lord. As we understand, that was a holy day. And what Nehemiah finds is that there were some in Judah who were treading wine presses, presses on the Sabbath and bringing in sacks of grain and loading them on donkeys as well as wine, grapes, figs, and all kinds of loads. And you see what was going on uh, was such a travesty here with what the people were doing on the Sabbath day. So he reprimands the nobles. What is this evil thing that you were doing? By profaning the Sabbath day. And he talks about how their fathers had done the same thing. And of course he says, yet you are adding to the wrath on Israel by profaning the Sabbath. In connection to the Sabbath day, it wasn't just the fact that the people were working, but the gates of Jerusalem. Okay? It says in verse 19, it came about that just as it grew dark at the gates of Jerusalem before the Sabbath, I commanded that the doors should be shut and that they should not open them until after the Sabbath. Then I stationed some of my servants at the gate so that no load would enter on the Sabbath day. Because of the people were doing all this work on the Sabbath day, you've got people coming in and out of the gates of Jerusalem. So Nehemiah says, we got to close them, shut them down. Kind of sounds familiar, doesn't it? 
Shut the border down. <laughs> we can understand things in our times. Verse 21, or I'm sorry, verse 20. Once or twice the traders and merchants of every kind of merchandise spent the night outside Jerusalem. Then I warned them and said to them, Why do you spend the night in front of the wall? If you do so again, I will use force against you. From that time on, they did not come on the Sabbath. And he says, I commanded the Levites that they should purify themselves and come uh, as gatekeepers to sanctify the Sabbath day. For this also remember me, oh my God. This is a phrase you're going to see over and over again, pretty much with all these situations that Nehemiah has to deal with when he comes back. Remember me, oh my God, for good. In other words, Lord, take notice of what I'm having to try to do here for your name to get things back in order. And have compassion on me according to the greatness of your loving kindness. That's what he says in verse 22. But here's another situation. This is going to be the last one that we really see here in the text. You've got the situation of these Jews who are marrying women which were unlawful for them to do. People that God had commanded them not to marry and that were going to pull them away from the one true God if they were not careful. They had married women from Ashdod, Ammon, and Moab. And he talks about the confusing situation about their children, half of them speaking in the language of Ashdod, and none of them was able to speak the language of Judah. And imagine how troubling of a situation that would be when you've got a new generation of children who are back here in Jerusalem that don't even know the Judean language. They don't know the language of Judah. And as he contends with them and curses them, listen to how rough the situation was. He struck some of them and pulled out their hair. He is having hard to try to get their attention to show them how wrong this is. So he says, you shall not give your daughters to their sons, nor take of their daughters for your sons and or for yourselves. Uh, because he made them swear by God with this statement. And he says, did not Solomon, king of Israel, sin regarding these things? We know what happened with Solomon and how those women pulled him away from God. Yet among the many nations there was no king like him, and he was loved by his God, and God made him king over all Israel. Nevertheless, the foreign women caused even him to sin. Notice what Nehemiah says in verse 27. Do we then hear about you that you have commanded all this great evil by acting unfaithfully against our God by marrying foreign women? Even one of the sons of Judah, the son of Elisha, the high priest, was a son-in-law of Sanballat, the Horonite, so I drove him away from me. Remember them, O oh my God, because they have defiled the priesthood and the covenant of the priesthood and the Levites. And then 30 and 31, which will close this out. Thus I purified them from everything foreign and appointed duties for the priests and the Levites, each in his task. And I arranged for the supply of wood at appointed times and for the first fruits. Remember me, O oh my God, for good. A leader will continue contact as we see him come back to Jerusalem. Or even as I worded it for the class tonight before I found out what James's point was going to be, as we focused on two different things, really, a leader is irked by evil. And I can definitely see that in the passage as we see all these things that Nehemiah is having to contend with when he comes back to Jerusalem. And oh, what a scene transpires when he comes back. With how long he was gone, all this had unfolded in that time. Now, I'm not going to have time to go back and do a review of the remaining portion of the book of Nehemiah, but James has done a great job of giving you some leadership principles in the book of Nehemiah. I am indeed sorry that he could not personally close this class out tonight, but... This brings this study of the book of Nehemiah to a close as we've examined these leadership principles in the book. And it's not just for men, it's for women also because as James has brought out to us, there are things in this book that we can all take from to help us learn how to be a better leader. Whether we're talking about 
our men in the leadership in the church, whether we're talking about uh, leadership in the workplace, if we're talking about uh, leadership in the home, there are many different facets which we could apply some of these principles that we find in the book of Nehemiah. I will do this real quickly before we close out with a word of prayer this evening. It's been a great quarter of Bible study here in the auditorium with James in this study on Nehemiah. Our new Bible class quarter is going to begin this coming Wednesday evening. Bob Ruddick is going to be teaching from the book of James. I'm looking forward to that and hearing what Bob is going to share with us on the book of James. And then on Sunday evenings, I'll be in here and we're going to take a, a look back, uh, unless something changes between now and then, we're going to look back at the book of Acts. We might even do this in a little bit different fashion this time, but that's what we're going to be looking at on Sunday evenings, um, especially since James had ended a study on the Old Testament. We'll come back and look at the book of Acts, uh, examine the history of the church, uh, some evangelism techniques, uh, power of the Holy Spirit, many different things we can look at in a study of the book of Acts. Congratulations to the Krim family and Michelle's obedience to the gospel tonight. I called her my sister and I hugged her right as soon as we came up out of the waters of baptism. What a blessing that was. I know all of you are looking forward to speaking with her tonight and to congratulate them. What a blessing that is for us to be here together. Let's close out with a word of prayer. Our Father in heaven, we're so grateful for this time together. We're so happy for the decision that Michelle made to put you on in baptism. We know that her sins have been cleansed, and we know, Father, that they'll continue to be cleansed if she walks in the light, and that she'll have that fellowship with all of us, and that she'll have that continual cleansing of her sins. We're so thankful for the blood of Jesus and what it does for us. And, Father, we are so grateful that we can indeed make sure that our soul prospers in addition to our physical health as well. We thank you for Christ and that death that he died on the cross uh, with that work in the scheme of redemption as he went to the cross for us. But, Father, we're also grateful for that life that he lives as he's there at your right hand as we speak, making intercession for us as our advocate and as our high priest. Forgive us of our sins. We ask that your will be done. It's in Christ's most holy name we pray, and amen. We are dismissed.